Stephen Kreifeld. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Sven. It's nice to be here. Great to have you here. Now, so Stephen, uh, you've written a very great paper called Experimental Philosophy of Technology. Now, that paper is going to be the topic of our conversation today. And so what you do in this paper is that you articulate and defend a research program that you call Experimental Philosophy of Technology, or Tech X5 for short. I think that's how you meant uh, it to be pronounced, yes. right? Uh, okay, so now before we get to Tech X5 or Experimental Philosophy of Technology in particular, I thought maybe it would be good to first say something about what is experimental philosophy more generally. So maybe, Stephen, uh, could you explain first, you know, what is experimental philosophy? Right. So, yes. Um, thank you, first of all, for your kind words about the paper. Generally put, and so this is the background of the paper, experimental philosophy is um, an interdisciplinary, primarily philosophical field of inquiry that uses experimental methods from the cognitive sciences, in particular uh, psychology, in order to investigate questions that are uh, traditionally within the domain of philosophy. Now, uh, experimental philosophy was initially a uh, kind of response to the perceived widespread use of intuitions in philosophical theorizing, um, particularly within uh, analytic philosophy. But then it quickly moved beyond uh, kind of scrutinizing intuitions to a, a richer array of, of, of methods and kind of a wider range of subjects. Okay, so that's pretty general. So maybe uh, it would be helpful to have... Uh maybe one or two concrete examples. So what, is there some uh, famous x study that you could mention to kind of illustrate what you were just talking about? Yes, definitely. So I think I'll, I'll stick to one example, which is uh, one of the classic ones. It's gonna take a little bit of time to, to explain it. Um, so this is the Nob effect. It's called uh, that after Joshua Nob, who's one of the originators and uh, popularizers of experimental philosophy. Um, and so, what, uh, what uh, Joshua Nob wanted to do was he wanted to find out how ordinary people think about intentional action. So he was in interested in intentionality from a philosophical perspective. But rather than um, consult his own philosophical intuitions, he actually went out and investigated how ordinary people think about uh, intentional action. So he published a study in 2003, and uh, he actually went to Park, Manhattan Park, and uh, he presented pastors by with uh, the following scenario. And he just asked them about it. This is the scenario. So um, basically, the CEO of a company is sitting in his office when uh, the vice president comes in and says, uh, look, we are thinking of, of starting a new program. It will help us increase our profits, but it will also harm the environment. And the CEO responds that he doesn't care about harming the environment. He just wants to make as much profit as possible. So the program is carried out. Uh, profits are made and the environment is harmed. So these are the facts. Now, the question is, did the CEO intentionally harm the environment? So when well, people were asked... It sounds like, yes, it, uh, he, he, he did intentionally harm the environment. Right. And so you would actually be in the majority of, of responders uh, to, this, uh, to this question. Uh, in fact, 82% of people responded that, yes, he did. He intentionally harmed the environment. Now, um, maybe that's not so interesting. But what is more interesting um, is what happens when we change the scenario so that the word harm... Uh, becomes help, right? So in that case, the CEO doesn't care about uh, helping the environment. He still just wants to make as much profit as possible, um, but his actions still result in both outcomes, so also helping the environment. I think you would not initially expect a difference. They're the same facts of the matter. However, the interesting thing is that when faced with the question, did the CEO intentionally help the environment? Remember, 82% when it was harmed said that the CEO intentionally harmed the environment. In this case, only 23% of participants responded, yes, uh, the CEO intentionally helped the environment. So this asymmetry in responses between harm and help um, is what is now known as the NOB effect or the side effect effect. So the side effect of asking the questions. And um, what these findings sort of show is, um, well, they challenge the idea that there's kind of a one-way flow of judgments from the factual to the non, uh, the factual or the non-moral domain to the moral domain. Now, there's lots of been written about this, and in fact, Joshua Nob, you know, in terms of the meaning of the experiment, what it actually shows, has changed his mind. Uh, but I think this is a very good example of some of the work that is being done in uh, experimental philosophy. Okay, well, I certainly found myself with the intuition that uh, the CEO had not helped the environment intentionally, even right. though 
I did have the intuition that he had harmed the environment uh, intentionally. And so I was using the word intuition there, and, and you were also using it before when you were talking more generally about what X, Phi, or experimental philosophy is. So maybe uh, it would be a good idea to explain, you know, what do we mean exactly by this word intuition? So do you have a particular theory or understanding of intuition in mind when you're approaching the topic of experimental philosophy, Stephen? Yes, definitely. I mean, I don't want to get into the topic uh, that much. There's a very uh, large literature on what intuitions are, but I think for these purposes, it's helpful to adopt the definition uh, that I do also in the paper by Michael Devitt, um, who proposed, I think, in, in a 2015 paper, a kind of minimal uh, view of intuitions that brings them quite close to our ordinary uh, ability to recognize them in the way we usually talk about them. So um, his account of the ordinary meaning of intuitions intuition is that it is um, an immediate judgment. So intuition is immediate judgment. Um, that is judgment without reasoning or inference. And I think you can also put it differently and say that intuition in this sense means unreflective judgment. It's the judgment without reflection. Um, and judgment uh, here can actually refer to kind of the mental event or state, or it can be the propositional content of that event or state. Um, so for the intuition that you know X is wrong, for example, um, that would be the unreflective judgment that X is wrong on this kind of minimal view. Okay, sounds reasonable. Uh, so, okay, so we have an idea of what experimental philosophy is in general, and we've also heard about uh, a certain example, the, the Nob effect, uh, which is, of course, is well known. And then uh, we just learned a, li a little bit about what you mean when you talk about intuitions, which was very helpful to know for this conversation, I think. Now, uh, okay, so if um, experimental philosophy in general, among other things, is interested in empirically investigating intuitions, then presumably experimental philosophy of technology would be interested in, in uh, also experimentally or empirically investigating intuitions. Now, I could imagine that uh, some would start being skeptical here, some philosophers, I mean, some people don't like talk of intuitions, and uh, some people object to uh, experimental philosophy more generally. And one of the things that you do in your papers is to sort of anticipate possible objections before you start laying out what you actually want to do with this type of research. So maybe we can talk about right. those three, I think it is, uh, objections that you kind of anticipate and respond to. And then we will go into the question of, okay, what exactly do you more positively mean by uh, tech x -Fi? So let's, uh, let's talk about those, those objections that you respond to. Right. Yes, no, I thought it was important to address the objections because they are part of the experimental philosophy uh, body of literature and the responses to experimental philosophy. Um, so first of all, uh, kind of the argument against uh, experimental philosophy is that intuitions do not in fact play a role in philosophy. So that's a posi uh, position taken by philosophers like Hermann Kappelen and Timothy Williamson, for instance. Um, and so the idea is that, well, you know, why are we talking about intuitions or studying intuitions when they don't play a role in philosophy? What strikes me, however, is that um, whether or not intuitions play a role in philosophy is at least partly an empirical matter, which can be studied. And there's, there's a, a fact of the matter to be, to be discovered there. Um, and it also strikes me that rather than sort of deny that intuitions play a role in philosophy generally, um, it would actually be better to take a, a kind of more fine-grained uh, approach and look at it by sort of examining specific philosophical theories, assumptions, and so on, and seeing whether intuitions are playing a role um, there. They might, they might not, um, which again, that seems to fall within the scope of experimental philosophy rather than sort of um, be a way uh, against taking that kind of approach. Okay, so that was the first objection. I think you have a really uh, strong response to it, but uh, there are two more. So what's the second uh, objection and what's the response to that one? Right. So again, it's a rich area, but uh, but the second objection would be that um, um, intuitions, in fact, should not play a role in, in philosophy. Right. So this is a normative claim rather than the descriptive uh, claim that they do not play a role um, as in the first objection. And um, what I think should be noted here is that in order to kind of get at this normative claim, first of all, you need to have some idea, some uh, description of whether or not and per perhaps the, the extent to which uh, intuitions do in fact play a role uh, in philosophy. So it would sort of presume the first uh, kind of uh, response to the first objection. Um, and again, so both the descriptive claim as well as the, as well as the normative claim uh, 
can and I think should be taking, uh, taken up within experimental philosophy. So that neither objection should discourage us from you know, taking this approach in the first place. Okay, yeah, now that's also convincing to me. Now, uh, what about the third objection and, and your response to it? Right, so the, the third objection is that uh, um, experimental philosophy is not properly philosophy, uh, right? I, this is not an objection that I think uh, um, is particularly valuable. And um, I mean... It is one that one hears a lot, though, I think. So it's, 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 it's really good, I think, that you're responding to it. Yeah, so you do hear it a lot, and in the sense there might be a little bit of gatekeeping about what philosophy is and so on. Um, I think it's fundamentally dispute uh, about whether empirical work has a rightful place within uh, the discipline of philosophy. And I think it's, it's, it's totally legitimate to ask to what extent empirical work should have a role in philosophy. Um, uh, it's just to say that it should have no uh, role at all seems to me putting it very strongly, uh, too strongly. So I tend to reject the terms of the, of the debate about whether philosophical questions are or should be kind of impervious to empirical research. And I think that actually experimental methods uh, can, can complement and, and do complement rather than displace uh, more purely analytic methods. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, I myself, I think one should be a kind of pluralist about methods in philosophy. And I mean, I also think that uh, we can think about this on the model of sort of a division of labor. So maybe, you know, maybe you can use one method, I can use another, and then, uh, you know, we can compare our findings. And uh, I, I, I see no reason why we all would have to use the same methods and why that would sort of help the field. So I definitely agree with you that, it's a good idea to try out uh, not just the, a lot of traditional methods, but also introducing perhaps untraditional or new methods. So I uh, definitely agree with that. Now, uh, when you start sort of laying out what you think that we should be doing when we start adding these additional methods, you talk both about a negative, as you put it, uh, part of the research program of uh, the experimental philosophy technology and a positive aspect or part of the program. So uh, let's talk about both of those and maybe starting first with the negative part of the program. So what do you have in mind by, by that expression? Right, so um, I wanted to kind of keep continuity with experimental philosophy, which is, uh, which is often divided in, in kind of a negative and positive program based also on this um, original kind of stance on intuitions. And uh, the negative program is, is based on, on this initial response, I think. Um, so in general, the negative program in experimental philosophy uses experimental methods to show that um, certain intuitions, assumptions, or judgments are ultimately uh, unreliable or untenable, right? So one of the ways to do this is to try to debunk, um, which would mean to demonstrate as, as unreliable, unstable, biased, and so on, uh, these intuitions, judgments, assumptions uh, in philosophy and ethics of technology when we're applying it to uh, um, these, these uh, subject areas. And the negative in this, in this uh, program kind of refers to the, the aim and the role, which is to critically examine uh, intuitions and assumptions that may kind of escape the uh, arguments, the concepts, the theories themselves, and to thereby advance philosophical debates by showing that these may have been mistaken. And so to move on from there. Yeah, okay. So th that sounds kind of interesting, but it's, it's still pretty abstract. And so uh, here again, it might maybe be good to think about a particular example and to see uh, how this could be useful, especially since we haven't talked a lot about technology yet and philosophy technology in, in particular. So let's maybe talk about uh, one example that you think is uh, relevant from the point of view of the negative uh, part of the uh, program. Right, yes. So um, I have a couple of examples in, in the paper. I think uh, one of the big ones is, is um, the discussion surrounding responsibility gaps. Um, so uh, as many people will know, this is sort of the worry that in increasingly complex uh, systems, particularly where there's kind of a, a human input combined with more or less autonomous AI, um, there might sort of arise a, a, a gap wherein it's not quite clear how to attribute responsibility when something goes wrong. For instance, when uh, such a system or when, when AI or, or robots uh, cause harm. Um, now, what I, what I do in the paper is kind of argue that, that, that some of the arguments surrounding responsibility gaps um, seem at least partly based on the intuition that being unable to attribute responsibility to someone or something is problematic uh, for individuals and for society. Um, 
And there seems to be kind of an empirical assumption there behind this intuition that uh, such gaps uh, can or, or will actually occur, um, excuse me, and um, that this will be problematic, which I think is worth experimentally testing um, to see whether in fact um, these gaps can uh, arise and whether they are problematic. Yeah, and so uh, maybe a, a follow-up on this, if I may. Uh, so, I mean, in the literature about responsibility gaps, uh, people talk about different kinds of gaps. I mean, a lot of them have to do with uh, what you might call negative responsibility. So uh, something bad has happened and we're looking for someone to hold to, a, to account and uh, to maybe blame uh, or punish for this. And so John Danaher, for example, talks about what he calls retribution gaps. Uh, people have a sort of... Uh, uh, I don't know, the desire to punish, uh, the, you know, wrongdoers. Uh, so that's, you know, one kind of gap that people talk about uh, on the one hand, but uh, there's also uh, responsibility doesn't only have a negative side, it also has a kind of a positive side. So let's say that, I mean, you've written this very nice paper and I think uh, you're praiseworthy for it, uh, you're positively responsible and I'm, you know, I want to kind of recognize your achievement here. So uh, let's say that we had an AI system write your next paper for you, so to speak, then suddenly maybe uh, I might be much less. So maybe even, even if it kind of went through your old philosophy work and, and based its AI written uh, philosophy paper on that, maybe I would be less inclined to give you credit for this. Mm -hmm. uh, so that might be a, a, what, what you might call a, a positive or a sort of an achievement gap. That's actually John Danaher and I have called that. Right. Now, when you think that we should critically... Uh, look at the responsibility gaps and intuitions about them uh, using this negative method. Uh, do you think that all responsibility gaps are sort of created equal or are there ones that you think are particularly important to maybe try to debunk? Right. So, I mean, that's actually a good question. I don't, I don't have a, a rank of them, but I would say that, um, so I have actually done some work on, on retributive intuitions. I engage with the work of John uh, Donner, which I think is very important. I criticize it, but I, I criticize it, I think, in a way that um, is, is um, that sheds some light on, on perhaps also an experimental uh, philo philosophical approach, because I try to, in a sense, de debunk some of these, these intuitions, these retributive intuitions. So in, in response to your, to your question, I would say that um, when we want to, uh, to, to answer the question of what's most important to kind of examine, I would say any, any kind of intuitions or um, any kind of intuitions that are potentially associated with with harm or reactants kind of socially undesirable responses um, so for instance when <clears throat> when uh, robots cause harm there's not a clear candidate for blame uh, people go out on the streets and attack you know self self-driving cars or whatever i mean those would be the kind of uh, cases where it's very important to look very carefully at, at what's happening and to try to figure out uh, uh, what's going on with people's intuitions and what we can do about it Okay, so uh, it's strictly speaking, it could be that there are some responsibility gaps that uh, are driven by intuitions we should try to debunk, whereas there might be other ones that may not be driven by intuitions that are in need of being debunked, so to speak. Uh, and of course, I mean, I myself am quite interested in that topic, so we could very easily go off on a tangent and talk about that uh, for a very long time. But I, mm -hmm. I want to focus primarily on your, your paper and, uh, and you, you, you just use that as a kind of one example. And so let's uh, turn now to the, the positive program. We talked about trying to debunk things and prove that they're wrong, uh, but uh, that's not the only aspect of experimental philosophy that you're interested in and that you want to bring to the philosophy of technology. You also want to uh, turn to the more positive side of the program. So let's, let's uh, maybe talk about that. And so could you tell us what you mean by the positive part of the experimental philosophy program? Right. Yes. So um, I think, I mean, I think the positive program is also very important uh, because if you just focus on, on the negative, it's, uh, uh, it can be quite limited. But the positive program in, in experimental philosophy uh, involves kind of make, trying to make progress directly on philosophical issues. Um, and so for, for experimental philosophy of technology, um, what this would in, uh, involve is kind of a similar effort to experimentally investigate the intuitions, assumptions, thoughts, emotions, concepts, and so on that are relevant to topics in philosophy and ethics uh, of technology. So not just um, the theories perhaps that philosophers and others have proposed, which you can, which you can examine and, and try to advance in some ways uh, through experimental uh, methods, but even just the ways in which people engage with technology uh, itself 
uh, you might experimentally investigate from a, a philosophical perspective. It is important to keep that philosophical perspective because, of course, there's huge research programs in psychology that also touch on, on some of these issues. Um, but, but what experimental philosophy adds is, is that kind of further reflection, okay, what does this mean for our theorizing? Okay, so, I mean, you mentioned uh, uh, keeping this a little bit different from psychology there. And before you also mentioned the example of self-driving cars. And so I, that made me think of one case that may be a kind of a, on the borderline between psychology and ethics or philosophy, namely the so-called moral machine experiment. And so this is the big right. research project uh, where some behavioral economists and some social psychologists have been investigating people's intuitions about what self-driving cars should do in sort of trolley problem-like scenarios. You know, if, if the car goes left, it might need to run into three grandmothers. If it goes right, it might need to run into th three grandfathers and a dog or something like that. Mm -hmm. and lots of different variations have been tested. I mean, in some variations, the, you know, the brakes are not working on the car. If the car keeps going straight, it's going to uh, run into someone who's crossing the street in a red light. You know, if it, uh, it tries to save that person, you have to sacrifice two people in the car, etc. So, uh, and then there have been millions and millions of people who have participated in this experiment. And uh, they've found some really interesting patterns in people's intuitions. But at the same time, there has been some uh, criticism of some of these, uh, uh, you know, arguments that they've made using this data. So, I mean, would, is that a good example of the positive program? Or uh, do you think that that is more the psychology uh, or, you know, how do you, you relate your own ideas about the positive program to this moral machine experiment stuff? Right. Yeah. So thanks for bringing that up. It is uh, it is an interesting project. And I think it's potentially very interesting work that could be um, could be valuable um, in many ways. But I think how good it, it will be uh, ultimately will depend on sort of the, the sophistication of the experiments themselves. I know that they've been criticized for being very limited and oversimplified in terms of the scenarios that they test. Um, and also, it will also depend on the sophistication with which the research is linked back to, uh, to normative theories and to kind of more on social philosophy, which I think also has not always been adequately done. Um, and that's very important for the positive program. Um, if, if it can engage with sort of these larger questions and sort of inform them, um, then, it, then it can potentially make very important contributions. But if we're just in a sense collecting data and, and feeding that data into algorithms, um, there is a risk that we will sort of miss much of the, the moral and social discussion that is necessary for, for policy, for us to accept this kind of technology as societies. And we also risk um, if we take this data at face value, kind of committing the naturalistic fallacy and, and taking what people, you know, the preference that they give, uh, taking them as being morally right in themselves. Um, so there's, a, there's another account that's needed there, I would say. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a very interesting experiment, but uh, as I said, and as you were also indicating, it's controversial and it has been met with uh, lots of objections uh, by people, well, myself included, but uh, for example, uh, um, uh, Hubert Etienne, as a French philosopher, wrote a very uh, critical paper about this. John Harris and others have uh, criticized this in quite strong terms. And so it's certainly a controversial example. Now, maybe, maybe uh, to, to, it would be nice to also mention some other examples of relevant research. Do you think uh, it's uh, I mean, maybe also controversial, but uh, uh, what? Well, let's just talk about some other examples. So, what would be some other a nice positive examples of how one can investigate uh, empirically people's intuitions about technology? Right. Yeah. So, I, I think there there are two examples that are good because one is is uh, is an example of research that um, is not self consciously experimental philosophy at all, but I think it's quite close at sort of the thing that we could. Uh, do an experimental philosophy of technology. And then there's another example uh, where they actually explicitly adopt this, this framework uh, as a methodology. So uh, first of all, there's a, um, research by De Graaf and Malle um, uh, in a paper on people's explanation uh, explanations of robot behavior, where they show that explanations of um, robot behavior that are offered by people can actually reveal mental state inferences about robots in, in very subtle ways. Um, so they experimentally tested people's uh, mental state description, so whether or not they think um, you know, there's a mental state and, and what kind, uh, two robots. And they found that people 
use the same kind of conceptual toolbox of behavior explanations for humans and, and uh, robotic agents. So people described behavior across uh, both human and robot agents as you know, equally intentionable, uh, or sorry, intentional, desirable, and surprising, right? Which, which is interesting because um, robots are, don't necessarily have a, have a mental state. And so to ascribe these kind of things to robots uh, raises a lot of questions. And it suggests that there's some continuity as far as the description of mental states, uh, mental agency goes. Um, so yeah, so that research I think suggests that there's at least some of the conceptual toolbox that we use to ascribe mental states over overlaps for humans and robots, uh, robots who do not have mental states, yeah. Uh, yeah, so Marge de Graaf is a colleague of mine at Utrecht University and she certainly does extremely interesting work and that's a really good example of Definitely. that. Now, yeah. you also mentioned, uh, and what, what I think is really cool, that uh, uh, Gabriel uh, Lima or Lima, I'm not sure how to say it, uh, and, and the colleagues have actually sort of explicitly said, okay, they're, they're adopting this idea of experimental philosophy technology. Yes. Uh, so maybe we could say something about also what they discuss in their paper. Yes, definitely. So that's uh, it's very cool uh, research, and it's very much in line uh, with what I would expect, uh, what I had in mind uh, that experimental philosophy of technology might be like. Um, so they looked at uh, uh, people's urge to punish AI in legal systems, um, and um, they study whether people actually show a desire to punish automated agents. Um, these these kind of uh, in, in these kind of legal systems. And they found that they do. So people do desire to punish these agents, even though um, the, the entities in question were not recognized by the people as having any, any mental state, right? So people are punishing uh, things that have no mental state, to put it like that. Um, so there's an interesting kind of conflict or, or paradox here. Um, why would people do that? Why would people seek to um, punish something that they know has no mental state? And presumably kind of neither of the, of, of the uh, neither deterrence nor retribution, which are two kind of the, uh, are two main theories of punishment or reasons why people would punish, um, apply here, which points to something else that is driving these desires to punish. Um, I think they, they sort of suggest in the paper that it might be kind of indirect deterrence. Uh, in a sense, you might try to punish um, robot, robots or AI uh, that has no mental uh, state because, well, you never know who's watching, right? So indirectly, you might try to deter behavior. I think, I mean, it's a fascinating uh, line of research that the authors have, have opened up there. Yeah, and no, I, I read that paper, and I think it's really great, and it's really interesting. And also, this, I mean, it's super interesting how that relates back to what we talked about before uh, mm -hmm. with responsibility gaps and possibly trying to uh, debunk some retributive, uh, retributive uh, desires people might have. Uh, and I mean, it, uh, not only does it relate interestingly to that, it relates, it seems, also to the Marte de Graaf's uh, work on uh, attributing mental states to robots. Yes. And I mean, it reminds me of some discussion about responsibility gaps where, for example, Christian List argues that maybe uh, actually in the future AI systems will be able to be responsible and we can maybe fill responsibility gaps by actually mm. holding them responsible because they could... Uh, have some functional capabilities that would match up with what you, you need in order to be a responsible agent. Uh, so, I mean, there's lots of interesting uh, kind of connections between some of the topics that we've talked about with self-driving cars crashing and, and killing people, responsibility mm -hmm. gaps, and these ideas about whether it might make sense to punish uh, robots or to attribute mental states to them. These all seem to be uh, connected in interesting ways, which would be very interesting to investigate further. I mean, have you thought about uh, those kinds of uh, connections between those examples that you mentioned, or, or is that something that you might want to look at in future work? <laughs> well, yeah, definitely. So I was already thinking when you when you uh, proposed that, yeah, maybe in the future, there'll be a way, um, you know, that actually the gap might close because uh, um, there might be a way to attribute responsibility. Well, I think, you know, we don't have to wait for the future to kind of uh, see what happens. Uh, there's scenarios that we can think of and that we could give people and to kind of see um, you know, are people comfortable um, when uh, uh, in ascribing responsibility to machines in certain scenarios that we might think of um, as happening in the future? And that might be one way to kind of anticipate. I mean, it's not necessarily going to settle the debate, but it's one way to kind of already gauge 
um, how capable we are, or people in general, um, of dealing with these kind of issues, and and what that might mean, um, you know, for for normative theories, but also just for policy and and and, and other kinds of aspects of uh, of society. Yeah, definitely a fascinating topic. Okay, so we talked about some examples there, but let's now return to your paper. And so I said before that you're sort of responding to some possible objections uh, that one might have, but you're not only responding to objections, you're also sort of offering some positive arguments in favor of the program, uh, the research program of uh, Tech XFi. So let's maybe uh, talk about those and you, you present three arguments in particular. And so could you maybe uh, summarize those arguments for us? Sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's always good to think about positive contributions. And um, I think that in, in one way, um, so the first uh, would be that um, experimental philosophy of technology could be a really nice sort of uh, way of, of, of providing a meeting ground for researchers from, from different perspectives. So um, the fundamentally interdisciplinary nature of, of experimental philosophy of technology means that um, researchers from, from a wide range of disciplines and backgrounds could kind of work on uh, some of these issues, right? Psychology, philosophy, but also human machine interaction and so on. There's science and technology studies. Um, th there's, there's lots of room there for people to collaborate um, on the same topic, but, but from, from different perspectives, but keeping uh, in mind the same sort of general methodology and, and what you're trying to find out. Um, so that's the, the meeting ground is definitely a plus. And also there's a, quite a lot of interest in, in culture and cultural differences within experimental philosophy, um, which I think also is, is a nice thing to explore in, in experimental philosophy technology. I do think there's more and more interest in, in kind of cultural differences in how people approach technology, but this would be a way to kind of launch that even more. Okay. Uh, yeah, so those were, I think, two of the arguments, right? Uh, so we have the, the, the one argument is that this is a is sort of a, a nice opportunity to kind of work together with people in other fields. Right. Uh, am I right that that's the, the first argument or is that? So I might have. I, so actually, I think this, this is the second. So I, I think yeah. that's my fault. I, I so yeah. I mean, there are three. This was this was one, but it's the second in the paper. Yeah. So the first so the, so the first is actually um, that it can. Well, I mean, they sort of overlap, but the first yeah. is that it could provide a kind of unifying method. Um, right. So there's sometimes there has been some criticism um, regarding ethics uh, and philosophy of technology that there's not a lot of theoretical work done on methodologies. Um, it's, it's sort of, um, yeah, there's not been much advance when it comes to, to which methods we use and um, also to kind of bring together the, me the different methods that researchers might use. And I think that experimental philosophy can be kind of a unifying method um, that ties together. Uh, so it's not just a nice opportunity for researchers to work, but I think it's actually a very fruitful way to, to combine these different, uh, different subjects and, and different approaches. Absolutely, I, I definitely agree. Okay, so those were the two of the arguments, but those are yes. two out of three, so let's go to the third. Right, right, so the third is, is perhaps a little bit more, more uh, technical, um, but uh, given that, so th that the intuitions within philosophy of technology and intuitions, I think about technology more generally, are relatively unfamiliar territory from the perspective of our evolutionary past, our evolutionary history, I actually think that it's, it's valuable in and of itself to sort of be conscious of the role that these intuitions uh, might play. So when one is dealing, for instance, with um, an evolutionarily unfamiliar territory, so uh, as in the case of our technology-rich society today, um, it might be the case that our intuitions are less likely to be adapted to our environment and therefore might be less uh, likely to be reliable guides for, for our thought and, and action. <clears throat> So yeah. that's another advantage, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, it reminds me of a discussion about uh, our legal systems in a book by uh, Jacob Turner. Mm -hmm. uh, so he argues that, uh, you know, uh, it, well, the cultural evolution, if you will, of the legal system happened to a large extent before we had modern technologies like AI and robots. Uh, I mean, I myself was inspired by that argument when I was writing um, my book about humans and robots, which is called right. Humans and Robots, uh, and mm -hmm. so I was trying to adapt that argument and argue that a lot of our sort of moral sensibilities and our intuitions about things, such as what it means to be an agent and uh, to be a responsible agent, those two sort of developed, I mean, our brains developed biologically, so to speak, in human evolution before we had robots and AI, and then a lot of uh, the cultural evolution of our concepts also happened 
before. And so I'm, I'm not only our moral, uh, sorry, legal free frameworks, but maybe also our moral frameworks are sort of products that came about before we had robots and AI. And mm-hmm. so, uh, yeah, I don't know if, uh, I mean, you're familiar with, let's say, Jacob Turner's work. Uh, uh, I mean, I know that you did read my book, but that was a while ago. And so you may not remember what I was talking about. But I mean, have you thought about uh, the connection between, let's say, Turner's work about the legal system and how that might relate to uh, you know, what mm-hmm. I could help us with in this domain. Right. So I haven't really explicitly thought about it, but um, um, in, in, in a kind of academic sense. But so I did. I did read your book, which is great. I actually read it after the um, I wrote the paper, which in a sense is unfortunate because I do think there's a lot of o- sort of overlapping uh, material that could have been brought in. Um, but yeah. So I, I'm definitely I'm very sympathetic to this idea um, that when you uh, when you inter- when you are in a situation that just um, does not seem to be consistent with the sort of situations that we have uh, evolutionarily um, been familiar with, there is reason to think that something should be done and uh, that we should try to um, see, look very carefully at it and and and, and see what um, um, what should be done to accommodate this. Um, I do think so. I think that we should distinguish between something like um, in this area between surface um, as opposed to kind of deep changes in in our environment, Um, not, you know, uh, between kind of sort of a radical novelty and and novelty that, you know, might seem alien, uh, but that still somehow falls within within the sphere of our past experience, Um, because not all changes and not all, um, you know, developments are going to be uh, t- of of such a of such a nature that they're going to escape our capability to you know make sense of it psychologically or morally, um, but there's definitely a lot of interesting work to be done there. So uh, that yes, that would definitely be an avenue to pursue. Uh, I think. Yeah. Now, speaking of avenues to pursue, I mean, one of the last things I wanted to ask you was, uh, uh, I mean, setting aside uh, the, the stuff that we just talked about just just a moment ago. I mean, uh, are there other uh, avenues that you would like to sort of explore using this method of experimental philosophy technology uh, and any thoughts about future uh, concrete work that you either you yourself would like to do or maybe you would like to see mm-hmm. others do if, uh, if they pick up on this idea of experimental philosophy technology and any examples of things that you would like to see done? Yeah, so definitely. I mean, following up on some things we talked about, you know, looking at responsibility and retribution gaps, that would be very, very interesting to explore that more. Um, in terms of responsibility gaps, I, I, you know, very shortly outlined something in the paper, but just, you know, providing people with vignettes or scenarios of, of um, varying levels of, of complexity and, uh, you know, machine involvement and, and, and so on, and, and trying to vary the degree to which responsibility attribution might be easy, straightforward, or much more complicated or obscure, and kind of seeing how people deal with this. Um, that would be something that, that I would be very interested in doing and, and seeing what would happen there. Of course, in the paper, I only describe it. I don't do empirical work, but I would love to be part of the empirical work looking at that. Um, and then an, an, another uh, line of research would be on uh, moralization and technology. I'm very interested in moralization, kind of the process through which um, events, actions that might be morally neutral take on kind of moral properties. And especially in relation to technology, people's intuitions about kind of technology we're used to uh, versus new ones and, and whether there's a difference in the way that new ones, for instance, are moralized compared to older technologies. Um, I would ha- I have some intuitions about what might happen there, but it would be great to, to kind of test uh, uh, test that in the future. Um, yeah, and I mean, there's there's lots of work to be done. I think the cool thing about um, experimental philosophy and, and experimental philosophy technology in general is that creativity is is awarded, and also just interdisciplinary work, which is definitely uh, um, a big plus of the approach. I think. Absolutely, yeah. No, I agree that those sounds like really uh, sound all like really great projects uh, to explore. Now, uh, the paper is called "Experimental Philosophy of Technology," and it was published in open access, if I remember correctly, in uh, the yes. journal Philosophy and Technology. So, I'm sure a lot of uh, listeners of this podcast are going to be wanting to go out and check that out. And I uh, again, I highly recommend Stephen's paper. Uh, so, Stephen, thanks a lot for talking with us today about your paper. Thanks so much for having me, Sven. It was a lot of fun.